I'm back for one more look at Leo Strauss and his political thought, and I'm, I remember drawing mainly from uh, natural right and history and also what is political philosophy. My cat's going crazy tonight, so we'll probably be interrupted. One point that Strauss makes that I think is um, well worth making, and which I guess probably comes as a surprise at first, is that really um, Plato and Aristotle were less optimistic and less utopian than modern political philosophers, starting with, with Hobbes, even. Um, this despite the fact that Plato wrote The Republic about this ideal city in which justice reigned and philosophers ruled, and Aristotle wrote the politics in which he envisioned this optimal city in which everybody ruled and was ruled in turn. But Strauss was fond of pointing out that uh, these ancient philosophers didn't hold out high hopes that their vision of the best regime was going to actually come into existence. Um, Plato makes it extremely clear in the Republic um, that it's highly unlikely and he gives all sorts of, the, through Socrates, all sorts of reasons why, among which are that people will not cede power to philosophers. Uh, they don't like being ruled by those who have a claim to more wisdom than they do. And for another thing, true philosophers don't want to mess around with ruling because it's tedious and boring to somebody who doesn't really, uh, isn't really attracted to power or wealth. But modern philosophers, um, and I said starting with Hobbes because um, Machiavelli is kind of a mixed bag in this regard. So, but yeah, let's even talk about Machiavelli. That's, that's kind of where Strauss starts. Machiavelli thought that he could provide a formula, you know, um, in which uh, if, if a prince followed that formula and really understood Machiavelli's reasoning, he'd learn how to be a virtuous or, you know, mighty prince. Basically, Machiavelli appealed to the prince's desire for, uh, you know, power and, and glory and wealth. And he gave him all sorts of techniques. So any prince that was smart enough to follow Machiavelli's advice uh, would be able to become a superior leader. And then that advice that he gave was designed to create a stable society um, that was functioning well enough to supply the prince with a nice tax base and a, and a good popular army that could uh, defeat neighboring countries that were not so, so well advanced. So Machiavelli comes up with this quasi-scientific and formulaic view of, of leadership. And then when we get to Hobbes, uh, there's a different formulation. It's an appeal to the people at the bottom, the people who make up the society um, that agree to be ruled in a certain way according to their self-interest in a social contract. Hobbes' philosophy ends up in an absolute monarchy as the optimal form of government, but it's a popularly supported absolute monarchy. And the goals, again, are stability and, you know, economic prosperity, concrete things like that. Hobbes was trying to get, get around the conflict caused by religious divisions, and he wanted to set government on a, a more solid footing, um, and that, he thought, was uh, the self-interest, the interest of each individual in his or her own um, well-being in a material sense, physical survival, comfortable living, safety. And to this end, he provided a formula, a formula that, you know, you didn't have to be a genius to follow, uh, and if people followed it, would provide this stability. So you see this strange optimism coming out in the thought of, of thinkers like Machiavelli and Hobbes and then Locke and moving forward in the development of, of 
classical liberal thought, this optimism that it doesn't take geniuses, it just takes people of, of kind of average capability with a strong sense of self-interest um, willing to follow a formula. And since the formula was based on low but solid motivations, to borrow a phrase from Martin Diamond, it ought to be able to be had fairly routinely. So the modern philosophers became more optimistic that through political science, uh, you know, not the kind that we do now, but the kind they did, through political science, through the application of solid political reasoning and planning, uh, you could create a regime that was stable and lasting and performed better than the old regimes based on uh, wisdom or so-called wisdom, the aristocracies, which in practice were, you know, ruled by the nobles who, you know, might be more highly educated than the commoners, but didn't necessarily have that philosophic wisdom um, that, that, that maybe they pretended to have. So underlying modern political thought is this weirdly utopian character that um, there's this quite strong hope that we can get it right now, that now we're modern, we can, we have science. As we moved into, you know, the scientific revolution, of course, that became, you know, huge. You know, we have science that we're discovering how to control the natural world. We can also control the social and political world using our social and political science. And, and we can solve the problems that have never been solved before in the, all the millennia of human history. Well, that's quite a hope, is it not? You know, and, and it has not turned out to be true. Uh, we have not in any way solved all of our problems through the application of political science and social science. And I mean that not in the sense of political science as an academic discipline, but again, this idea that uh, we can apply reason and planning, that that has not solved all of our problems quite clearly, but it's such an overwhelming faith that despite the fact that the problems, you might even say in some cases, got worse, you know, more, more uh, violence or more corruption, um, more income inequality, whatever, you know, at the very least, I, you, you have to admit, we have not entered a state of stability and um, prosperity for all that uh, was dreamed of by Enlightenment philosophers. Though we have many good things, but we also have many bad things, and now including um, a growing acknowledgement uh, that we've to a certain extent messed up our environment pretty bad. Our current theme of dystopia, you know, we have like just so many books and movies and TV shows that are dystopian. Um, every, every young, you know, like junior high school kid knows what that word means now. Why? Because there's a growing skepticism, I think, in the general public towards the idea that, that we can solve all of our problems with human reason. That skepticism, by the way, is akin to ancient idealism, because ancient idealism included built in a skepticism about the ability of people to, um, to, to take the steps necessary to make the world a better place. They seem to understand better that, that uh, just keeping things on an even keel was a battle and that there would be peaks, but there would be also valleys and not this upward progression. And so, you know, I think I've mentioned before, I really like the current um, series, The Handmaid's Tale, based on the book by Margaret Atwood. And it's about how people live after you know, the, the environment's been fairly ruined and um, fertility has, has declined to the point where um, the society thinks it has to more or less enslave the few fertile women so that it can uh, continue to exist. Well, you know that that concern about lowering fertility is actually a huge issue in, in 
the zeitgeist, right? That fear and that concern reflects a deep and growing doubt about whether the modern Enlightenment project was one that could be accomplished or even was one that was, was good. And it's a mess. That skepticism also has something in common with classical conservatism. And in fact, in this way, we can kind of associate Strauss with classical conservatism, even though, as I understand it, Strauss didn't think very much of Edmund Burke's, um, I guess, status as a philosopher. He wasn't quite a philosopher, I think. But, uh, but nevertheless, a uh, classical conservative viewpoint is that human nature is, is, is very flawed and that there is no way to fix everything with political science and that sometimes the best we can do is hope for decent leadership and the right conditions and a little bit of luck and that we can muddle through informed hopefully by a decent sense of right and wrong classical conservatives conservative tends to think that the skills of coping are superior to the dream of conquering our nature something which has never successfully been done though the communists tried and the fascists tried and and now i suppose you could argue neoliberals are trying too because there's a similar faith and hope in that ideology that it will fix all problems eventually and that if we just adhere to a formula we won't have to muddle through anymore. I'm using that term formula because I want to emphasize that modern political thought is strangely mechanistic. The ancients believed that there was no substitute for good leadership, what they called statesmanship. Statesmanship started with a knowledge of justice. Somebody who was of a philosophic nature, who could understand what justice was and then could apply it in any given case. Statesmanship is the use of, of good judgment. Uh, they didn't think that there was any set of laws that could be so perfect that it would apply always well in every case without the use of judgment. In other words, there was no substitute for the human element, for human wisdom. But the modern philosophers tried to eliminate the need for human wisdom and judgment. And I have a list there of the different ways that some of these early philosophers tried to do so. Machiavelli tried to substitute for statesmanship the drive for power and glory. If you could find a prince, and you could find plenty, who were motivated by that drive, and you could show them how they could achieve that those things uh, through a formula, uh, then then you could have a successful prince and society. Hobbes substituted the motivations of fear and self-interest, which he thought he could count on being present in, in everybody and could use uh, as sort of like fuel in his political machine. And Locke substituted for statesmanship scientific reason and self-interest. In other words, they were taking what they considered to be constants in human nature that they could arrive at based on observations of uh, human beings and human history. And they were trying to create a mechanism for, harmony, for harnessing uh, those drives and those aspects of human nature. And of course, now we have people who think that the market can eliminate the need for statesmanship. You don't need human wisdom or judgment. You need to allow the market in the broadest sense, not only in um, goods and services, but also in ideas and also in um, all levels of human organization. The market can operate without anybody um, consciously intervening, or so we believe. And of course, the Star Trek folks believe that we can substitute some sort of technological singularity for good judgment. Maybe we can hand everything over to machines at some point, or Vulcans.
I'm sorry, I just needed to get Star Trek in there. Accelerationists sometimes believe in a technological singularity, too. So, in other words, modern philosophers tried to eliminate the need for wisdom, and they shifted the whole question of the best life or the good life to the individual. So, in the modern liberal system, the individual is told, that's up to you to figure out. You figure out what you want to value. Um, leadership you won't get leadership in that area. The state will not give you advice. Of course, it really does shape, and you know, as I mentioned last time, kind of defines for you what the best life will be by creating the environment in which you have to operate. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're told, you know, your choice of whether to be religious or not is up to you. What religion, if you are religious, is up to you. What, you know, what what you define as moral, um, all of these choices that you have or supposedly have, are, they're all up to you, which sounds wonderful and freeing, except for maybe we don't have as many choices as we think. But also, if you have this many choices, uh, if, or if you think you do anyway, that's quite a burden. It's hard. It's difficult if you're going to do it right. And as Tocqueville pointed out, for a lot of people, it turns into a sort of resignation and tendency to look around and see what the majority is doing with the hope that somehow the popular will will give the guidance that is lacking from above. In the liberal uh, state, the state becomes a neutral policeman. By, by that I mean that it enforces the laws, which we say are supposed to be applied to everyone equally and are aimed at creating a sort of even uh, playing field uh, for people to operate in commerce and in the free marketplace of ideas, etc. The state should not intervene and pass any sort of moral judgment. Again, uh, you know, real life is way more complicated than that, but that is the story uh, of our particular society. So you get the sense that a Straussian perspective is, is not going to be four square in the court of liberal democratic regimes, which is why um, the you know, the, the eventual identification with neoconservatism just doesn't really uh, work. But so what are some takeaways um, that might be useful from this reading of Leo Strauss? Well, as you, as you know, Strauss was inspired by, among other things, the political philosophy of, of Plato. And as such, he was a supporter of the old idea of moral absolutes um, with Socratic humility, in other words, with the, the knowledge that those moral absolutes are in a way not as absolute and can never be totally absolute um, because human beings don't always have full knowledge, information, or um, ability to fully arrive at the truth but it's worth the effort. They do reject, Strauss and Straussians tend to reject the idea of moral relativism. Now that, as somebody pointed out, um, that rejection of moral relativism can and does sometimes morph into an, an attack on critics of traditional morality. In other words, it may be used to attack those who reject things like traditional marriage or religious faith and at other areas of traditional morality. But we do have to remember Plato was not a defender of traditional morality. In fact, his teacher Socrates was executed because he was perceived to be stirring up trouble being subversive and attacking the traditional religious beliefs of his society. Platonic justice 
was supposed to be built on clear-eyed reason, and it went against traditional morality. The gods of the ancient Greeks didn't make much sense to Plato, and he said so. Cephalus, the old guy at the beginning of the Republic, who's pretty traditional and, in that sense, moral, and everything seems very simple and, and clear to him, backs out of that conversation pretty fast because he's asked a few probing questions by Socrates that he doesn't really want to answer. So anyway, um, I don't think it's at all clear that Strauss, in as much as he follows the Socratic Platonic teachings, would would join those who kind of um, blindly support traditional morality. Nevertheless, any sort of defense of moral absolutes can lead some people to do that. I will say this, if there are no moral absolutes, then anything goes, and pretty soon whatever is going around is something that you won't like. So I think that one lesson that can be learned from somebody like Strauss is that it's worth taking the time to make a moral argument to defend your position. It's not good for anybody who wants to try to defend their moral point of view to basically say, well, my point of view is as good as yours, because that's not a defense at all. It's very weak, and it can be, it, it can be basically defeated not with reason, but with force. And so I'm rather persuaded that, that Strauss is right, that it's very much worth the time to try to defend, you know, some notion of moral truth. But it needs to be defended and it needs to be disputed and continually examined. And we don't do that. So we're, we're not even engaging in that. And the society tends to just go back and forth in a, in a sort of battle about who's the bad guy. It's not fruitful. Another takeaway is just to say that Strauss was a friendly critic of classical liberalism because it didn't promote wisdom or political community and citizenship. So I just think, I you know, kind of made that point, but I want to make it again and make it clear. From this perspective, liberal democracy is prone to bad leadership, instability, crass materialism, anti-intellectualism, and poor citizenship. These are among the many pitfalls of this system that need to be watched out for. The problem with sort of blind love of this type of system is that you're not watching out for all the many ways in which it can go bad and therefore it's more likely to go bad. If you think it's perfect, if you think for instance that America is always a shining city on the hill and it can do no wrong, then it's likely to, well, it's likely that we're going to make some serious mistakes. Vigilance means assuming not the best, but possibly the worst, so that you can head it off. So properly understood, I think Strauss gives us a vantage point outside of liberalism and now neoliberalism that allows more objectivity so that we can do that. And this alien vantage point can help cut through the ideological possession associated with these and other isms. That term ideological possession has been used by Professor Jordan Peterson from the University of Toronto. He's a Jungian psychologist, and what he means by that is it's too complicated for me to get into now, but I, I want to do some pieces on the idea of ideological possession and what it meant to Carl Jung. But let's just say that when people become uncritical of their ideological position, and cannot see any points made against it as valid at all. Um, and when they shut out all countervailing information, they have become possessed, in a way, from this point of view, by their ideologies. I call them isms because all of them, all those ideologies end in ism, right? Um, and so from this vantage point, they can become like secular religions that draw people to such faith, 
such blind faith that they cannot see what is right in front of them. Properly understood, I think Strauss helps us learn that perhaps there is no one magic bullet or formula or mechanism that will make the world a perfect or better place. But instead, we have to rediscover the enduring importance of leadership and civic education to counter the tendency of our regime, just like any other regime, to decline and disintegrate. So, well, that's my two bits about Leo Strauss. I hope it's encouraged you to maybe go and find that book, Natural Right and History, or the other one is What is Political Philosophy? And um, do a little bit of reading uh, from one of those books and see what you think for yourself. All right. Thanks. Bye.